on this episode of Skeptico, a show about considering all your options. The president, I would not rule out the chance to preserve a nucleus of human specimens. Radioactivity would never penetrate a mine some thousands of feet deep. How long would you have to stay down there? Well, let's see now. Uh, 100 years. And a show about when crazy doesn't sound crazy. This crazy mutual destruction kind of thing. The way you lay it out, it actually kind of makes sense. They were starting off the seminar, but they were also concentrating on the nuclear arms race. So they were both really scared. In 1957, when um, nuclear war and foreign policy got released from the CFR working group that Henry Kissinger released it, and it kind of said, OK, what would be better than all-out nuclear war is that we have this slow perpetual warfare. That first clip was from Dr. Strangelove, which, if you've never watched it or if you haven't watched it recently is a must, an absolute must. And the second is from today's excellent, excellent guest, Johnny Vedmore of Unlimited Hangout, who has some just extraordinary articles that we're not even gonna be able to scratch the surface on, but I hope you will check out after listening to this interview. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science, spirituality, and other big picture stuff like we'll hear about today with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. And boy, oh boy, do we have a good one today. I'm just super excited to welcome Johnny Vedmore to Skeptico. He is an incredible investigative journalist, and I mean incredible. So you'll find some of his work on his website, johnnyvedmore.com, or you might also stumble across him on the very excellent unlimited hangout you know investigative journalism is more or less dead today right from the usual sources that you would find it you're just not going to get this kind of stuff particularly the way that johnny uh documents it uh researches it one of the fun things i hope we get a chance to talk about today is some of the methods. I mean, it's like old school. Hey, I had to dig into this archive and I used the Wayback Machine and that led me to 500 names that I had to trace. Now, everyone, this is true investigative journalism and it goes places that, as we know, you know, we're just not getting there through what we'd call our mainstream journalism. So it's really rare these days. But anyways, a a lot of work here. Also, a musician, right mm-hmm. hey what what do we want to play right now just a little <laughs> come on man oh my lord uh well i'm i you know i'm i'm proud of uh i i'd say uh evil is really war machine what you've got uh you got your, 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 yeah you're on the trigger <laughs> Damn, I'm ready to go. It's got a minute and a half synth solo at the end of that one. That's uh, that's, that's mostly synth solo, to be perfectly honest, rather than song. I'm fired up now. I mean, that's going to take me a while to settle back down. Okay, so um, anyways, Johnny, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining me on Skeptico. Well, thanks for having me. I mean, um, I... It's been a really hard journey to get to a point where where people know my name uh, because uh, I mean there's so much censorship in this and that's that, that that's partially like runs alongside the fact that like like you said investigative journalism is dead. I didn't really know what it was when I started doing it. You know, I didn't know what what I was heading towards because I'd never really seen that type of journalism. It's not introduced to you. It's out there in the back. And then, you know, there's a, there's a few people who have, have kind of like inspired me and their work has made me go, wow, wow, that's, that's what you do. You put, you put all the facts there and that's what investigative journalism is. You get all of the facts, as many as you could possibly find. And I'm a collector of facts. I suppose I'm a collector of these little uh, pieces of history, uh, little sources from history evidence from history that tells us a real story you know 
You know, it's funny you say that because I kind of get the other impression. I, I, a lot of the stuff I find more and more in the conspiratorial vein is this kind of data dump, you know, and I think you rise above that in that you do have a little bit of storytelling element. Maybe that's because of your, you know, uh, music background and you're telling stories and you're writing lyrics with the beginning and an end and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I don't know. I think it's more than that. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, I mean, uh, I spent years with a guitar, just sitting there with a guitar, writing song after song after song. And I tried how, to. How long? How long were you? What, what, what is? Give us a background on uh, on you. A, a, well, I, a Welshman, a Welshman, uh, a fighting Welshman with uh, an edge on the music we can hear. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I I mean, I had a really strange upbringing. Um, I, I'm from the capital city of Wales, so I'm from Cardiff. And um, but but my family and my dad was uh, uh he, we were in this uh, reenactment organ society. So it was a 17th century reenactment society called the Sealed Knot. And uh, every every week, almost every weekend, uh, and for sometimes weeks, I was out in a campsite somewhere, dressed in 17th century clothing, with people walking around in armor fighting with swords, cannons going off, muskets, gunpowder. I used to, when we used to travel down to the musters, um, because my father was the commanding officer of Colonel Birch's regiment at foot, I used to sit on the gunpowder keg that we used to travel to the actual uh, um, uh, events with for our regiment. Our regiment would have to bring their own gunpowder. Uh, that eventually stopped in the 90s, uh, late 80s and early 90s, when the regulations got more heated up and they, they were a bit more careful about allowing people with kegs of gunpowder on the road. Um, but I, I had this really strange upbringing. My father was a really eccentric man because of the way he was. He's like, uh, we had a re the, the society we were in was like 8,000 people. So you had 8,000 people dressed up, fighting for charity. Uh, loads of people would come watch. Of course, it was a massive event over the weekends. Uh, the commentary every night was just, you know, you're out in the middle of a field, out in the middle of nowhere with a load of friends you see every weekend, but you don't live with. And it was always party atmosphere. So I was brought up with that party atmosphere all around me all of the time. And I, you know, and I, I got to learn about history. I got, you know, really deeply, but by, by exploring the castles myself, you know, as kids, we would just let off the rain our parents because we did they we you know this campsite was closed off um usually usually they would just let us go off and we would have to return by 12 midnight when they finished their partying and and as a child that's what my life was we'd just go off in the middle of nowhere and we'd explore castles and we'd sneak into places we weren't allowed in and uh and then in the weekdays i had this normal life which go into school and everybody like my experiences were so far removed from each other. And I, I think that led me on to understanding that, you know, uh, what people see every day, what most people see every day is just a bit illusory. And, and there's actually this whole other world out there and you could be doing loads of different things all around the place. And you go back and sit in an office and everybody thinks you sit in an office all the time. You know? Yeah. I, I worked in hotels when I, I finally like, you know, when I, I got to, uh age of 19 i went into a full-time work in hotels and a lot of people talked to you i was on a reception desk friendly always talking with people uh meeting people from all around the world and there was loads of people i would meet who i discovered would believe that i was constantly behind a reception desk because that's what they saw and i understood like the idea of perception was really interesting for me i also had like a load of really negative experiences when i was young so my family there was like uh, even though we were really loving in the same way there was loads of violence like really hard violence um i was groomed from when I was nine to 11 by a guy who was in this organization, in this field not, and uh, ended up going to court um, and he got convicted and then he got let back into the society again and was just around me all the time. So I had this like loads of these, these horrible experiences I had to deal with in life as well. And, and it all really affected me negatively. By the time uh, I hit into my twenties, you know, September the 11th is happening uh, and, 
the world just seems like this crazy mess. You know, the internet's coming, everything's exploding all at the same time. Yet we've still got nothing. Like everywhere, everyone I knew had nothing. We were living off like we were earning like four pound fifty an hour. You know, I don't know how much that is in dollars, but it was not much, uh, and we couldn't get much work. And uh, the financial crisis was on its way. You know, life was really. Uh, sad and i kind of like kept trying to make sense of it and i kept going into a uh, kind of the internet world just exploring around and reading and reading and reading and not realizing while i was doing that that i was actually starting uh becoming a journalist i was i was one step away from being a journalist which i was gathering all information yeah i wasn't writing that information down and that was the only difference between before and after is that once upon a time I wasn't a journalist because I didn't write anything I knew down, um, and and anything I find it's not even what I know. You know, you what, what I always discovered is that you can tell people your opinion till the cows come home, and people disagree with it or not. You know, it doesn't matter. They 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 they're ethereal. They disappear really quickly. Opinions, you know, they go with trends and fads, and they go with the time. But when you collect real information, when you're telling people facts about the past and history, it can make them understand loads of things about their own lives and their own uh, interactions with the world that they could never understand before and suddenly their eyes are open to so much more and and it got or to, not or not yes, or, or not or not and uh, all of this time um i was uh, suffering from something called graves disease which was a really like it was undiagnosed for most of my life so only diagnosed when i was 27 it was a really heavy thyroid disease and uh, basically by the time i was 27 i was almost dying um so i i, I was like you know I, I, as my ill health was going uh, i was unable to sing I, unable to to keep a job um all sorts of symptoms were occurring uh it was still undiagnosed and i felt like completely and utterly lost and eventually that that got that got rectified and understood and then i had radioactive treatment and i had my thyroids taken out and then i had all of this depression anxiety and all this feeling of weirdness and i was put on loads of chemical for compounds fluoxetine and 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 other things uh, clomipramine and other things that made my my head go crazy um and i fell into that world i fell into that world and by the time i got to about 2014 2015 i was a mess. I was a mess, but I had like music. I my 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 sort of like musical projects I had built, and you know, the, music's really hard. You get into a band, you get into a band with other people, and and other people are you know, especially musicians, are usually crazy, fickle. They go, you know, they they they're airy fairy. They they turn on each other in, in, in with great ease, and so that wasn't going very well. And I was really depressed, and I was just like, what am I going to do? I I, I got to the point point where I was I had just been taking more drugs and more drugs and more drugs until eventually I was just on morphine and I was taking morphine I was puking up I I would say you know nearly nearly straight away nearly straight away it's like I was heading towards dying and I knew it I recognized it and I I the first time I really recognized it was um I lied to someone who I love very much about what I was doing and what I was taking and I within a day I just I just felt really like the lowest I felt in in years because I'd lied to someone I had completely adored um about something that was so horrible and I went to that person I said I need help I need to get out of it and they said you need to work out how to get out of it and so I went up to the Welsh hillsides and I picked a load of mushrooms and I spent about three months on mushrooms like is do or die I'm gonna have to like take everything into my brain i'm gonna to have to have this experience and i did what is it what grows up there what which kind of uh um a little welsh we we have what's called welsh magic mushrooms i can't remember the 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 uh, 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 the, the name are they the little hats. Christmas? Are they the little Christmas? Yeah, yeah. Ones? They're like little wizard, wizard hat sort of mushrooms, and they're beautiful. They're wonderful. They, they so powerful. They're really up high on on uh, the the mushroom scale, and you they're in abundance just just outside the city. You go up to Garth Hill. Anybody who lives in Cardiff. Go up to Garth Hill in the right time of the year. You can pick hundreds, 
thousands. You can dry them all out and keep them in a pot, and 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 Bob's your uncle. And I, I kind of just felt like I might, my certain parts of my life were breaking down. I had to reform, re, re take control of my life, come off drugs, come off all of these other things that had been, you know, that had been for, forcing me down. And that was, uh, it was just like it, it opened up another thing to me. It, it made me realize I, I got to a point where I realized, am I going to continue being quiet, living in this world where everything's miserable, all the people around me are unhappy, all the systems don't work, politics is horrible people are turning on each other it's getting worse and worse people are getting poor all the time do i want to live in that world in a little room taking morphine and dying and killing myself or do i want to go and say well if if i'm not going to kill myself that way because if i continue that way i'm going to die then you're going to have to kill me and so I've I I looked at the people who made me the most angry in society. You know the 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 secret services, the intelligence agencies, the people who are hiding things from people. I said, okay, I'm going to try and find a way. And politics mainly at first, I'm going to try and find a way to uh, you know reveal information, find information. Can I ask you this? Because like there's so many twists and turns to the story, but let's just go right where you were. You're up there and and you have the psilocybin experience. One, how did you even know to to do that? Or why did you think that would be, you know, somehow help you out of this situation? And then two, how how effective was it for you particularly uh to to kind of start healing? Yeah, if I was gonna I mean, my thought was that if I wasn't going to kill him, kill myself through drugs. I was just going to end up killing myself. And so the other alternative is that you party yourself to death, but I'm killing myself with the same stuff I'm partying with. So I needed to get earthly with it. I needed to get, I, I, I had already experienced psychedelics, already a big fan of psychedelics, never on that scale. I, I said, you know, I, I've really got to start, not just for, in a sense, it was a reset. It was, the reset it was a reset of the mind totally. it, yeah it was it was like you know a lot of a lot of it i spent um i you know i i one night i took and what what terence mckenna would call an epic dose of, of mushrooms um and i i fell asleep and i i don't remember uh, the night uh, the dreams anything i just remember waking up and feeling this complete feeling of refreshment like it refreshed my soul and i was doing so much in the way of mushroom i just felt like i was constantly it was about resetting my sadness my inability to to uh concentrate on certain things i was taking you know like the aspect that i got groomed I mean, if you try and look at that when you're on psychedelics, you have to look really deep within yourself and you can disconnect yourself, but you can also be with yourself. And I started to kind of understand that the things that happened in the past were kind of a different person, you know, or nearly every single uh, bit of your bone and your skin will, will fall off and, and reform during like every six, 12, 18 months, depending on what thing it is. And eventually you just reform to be a new person and you hold all of this angst and all of this pain with you for someone who, if you can get into the right frame of mind, you can uh, sort of communicate with that person from an external uh, in an external sense, in an external way, you can say, "I know what you went through. I really do. I, I, I'm the only person who can know what you went through." And I, I learned to let loads of things go. I learned to let loads of things go. But in letting things go, also, I, I, I saw what was important. And the whole time, you know, I, I, there was a sense that the, the only thing you learn from resetting yourself on mushrooms is truth is the only thing that's important truth going out there and finding truth that's 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 the you know it's always opposing whenever you anything psychedelic you know it's good bad it's all it's, it's so juxtaposed the whole experience but truth as opposed to lies because everything when you examine it everything that, that that has caused you pain throughout your entire life all stems from lies it all stems from that one thing that someone told you something that is not true and it has hurt you 
Well, you know what uh, is kind of interesting about that, not to just pry totally into your personal kind of thing, but like you grow up in an intentional alternative reality. I mean, you were doing simulation before there was simulation. Like now it's, you know, I've had guests on, are we living in a simulation, a popular topic, you know? Dude, you were living in a simulation by choice. And, and your father, to put you in that, you know, I'm a dad, got four kids. I can be eccentric as hell every weekend. And then, uh, you know, creating a situation where something like that could happen not that he's it, responsible it, he hey 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 he's he's uh, my, my father who i don't i don't really speak to my father he's a he's a special man to be sure he uh he ex extremely eccentric in his way unable to see anything but himself through most of his life and and really really impressive did anything that he put his mind the commander would do the commander yeah, but not only was he the commanding officer afterwards he became a town crier so like the oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah um and once upon a time he was a steel worker for 18 years and he grew up in a pub in the roughest area of cardiff and he's got all of these different strings to his bow and his his cupboard used to be filled with like loads of different costumes and diving gear and all sorts of things that usually hey, hey, why, don't, why don't you guys talk why don't you guys talk um, uh, but mainly because he was a, a terrible philanderer. Uh, he was he was awful with the ladies. He treated my mum like crap, and there was a lot of violence in my house when I was younger. So I, I, I it comes to a point where anybody, and this is a, a message to a, a, as well can be a message to anybody who physically abuses their children. At some point, their ch child will reach adulthood and will look at you in the eye and you will shrivel up into a ball and walk away. That's it. There, there is, there is, there, there is very rarely someone who can repair damage when it's been like years of physical, uh, really violent stuff. He was a big guy. Was he ever able to own any of that? Yeah, <sighs> uh, not with, not with me. No, no. He, I mean, I, 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 I think with my, with my sisters more. Um, and I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's really hard because I, I, I love, you know, we all love our family so much and I, I, I love him in many ways. I see myself in him in many ways. Sometimes when I look into my son's eyes, I see my father. I understand the, the idea of looking back at your father's face through history and almost every uh, mimetic moment in, in movies such as Star Wars, when you cut off the face of yourself and decide discover it's your father underneath and it's just your face and it's your father and it's your face you know this is this, we, this is what builds our psychology all of these things or you know people don't suffer uh um a death from just one thing when they they like come to an end when they could decide to commit suicide you know it's death by a thousand cuts it's all these different experiences from all around all piling up but if you can rationalize each one and you could take out each one and you can understand why and i don't blame my dad for the way he lived his life i think part of it uh and i i think he'll accept it was extremely high strength alcohol uh beers mainly growing up in a pub didn't help him and he was wild and no one brought him back in uh my nan was the great greatest person around and my grandpa was the greatest person around but i don't think they could control my dad um so so you know he's a man of his time very much so very he, he he's molded me in many different ways the only thing we ever got on uh together um with was war games he he taught me how to play because he, he wanted to do it himself and I had no one to play with. He taught me how to play Axis and Allies when I was like uh I, I don't know, I was probably about seven, six, seven. And and then he would invite around his wargaming mates and I would beat them all. That, that was basically because <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't uh, have these pre concepts of what had happened throughout history that they all automatically seem drawn towards doing the same mistakes throughout well, history well, that lost God well the right. other thing I, I picked up from your bio uh the two things one is you go through this dyslexic kind of thing you're tagged as being dyslexic yeah, yeah, yeah. like so many creative people are and now you know you're a writer a first class caliber writer here folks you just got to go read the articles and you'll see it's and so 
that that's kind of you're you're probably tagged as being not super smart right isn't that what you were told kind of growing up i i think i think there's a lot uh i saw a lot of what i see in society now in the way i was treated at school um in the fact that i would the teachers all knew that i was good enough to go up to the next class but they would keep me from going up to the next class because there was I, I had too much of my dad in me, maybe. Maybe I could say that. Um, I hung around with some of the bad boys. Uh, I hung around with everybody, but I tended to like doing naughty things. And when we were teenagers, we were awful. In Cardiff, we were awful. We were breaking into houses and we weren't stealing stuff from people. We were going and using their telephone to phone porn lines. And we would we would watch all their movies, eat all of their food, leave the place a mess and go again. Like, you know, we we would do we were doing naughty things. We were breaking our windows for fun, we we're burning garages and outhouses. So um the the teachers knew what we were doing. It was a sm Cardiff, maybe three hundred thousand people, but it's a small place. Everybody gets to know all of the rumors, and I got tagged as a troublemaker more than I got tagged as anything else. And um, and so I, I remember one time when it was maths, we had to decide whether we, they had to decide where we were going up a grade. I must have been about thirteen, and I got like something like seventy percent in the test. And the girl who I had gone to a uh, uh, primary school with and known for ages got sixty one percent, and she got chosen to go up, and I got kept behind, and I. I asked them why and they said well you're just trouble and none of the other teachers want you so it was just you know that sort of theme kept going and so in school i did the same thing as i do when i write now which is i i basically said no to teachers but i argued with them in a logical way and uh like the, the headmaster used to sit me down uh when whenever and we, we'd have a conversation about why i wasn't doing the thing so whenever they the teachers the worst threat they could do was go to the headmaster i went to a school which was extremely the headmaster was extremely christian and it was a policy of no expulsion whatsoever so you could only be suspended and i was never suspended there every time they sent me to the headmaster he would give me a cup of tea we would have some chocolate biscuits and we would sit around and he would ask me why all of these different things and i would give him answers to why and that that was basically you know that was the cycle i was in then i i just then didn't go to school for for the last year or so of it you know i i there was no one there who could keep me in school and 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 then they still let me into college and that's when my parents relationship was breaking down and my dad was terrible with my mum and my mum had was on the lowest like place she could ever be my sisters uh, were just old enough that they had left the house uh, left the home um so i ended up like just trying to like help my mum for two years go through the most horrible uh relationship and then that's really the first time when investigating began because uh i had to find out who my dad was having an affair with uh the name the woman in the court documents and i went through library polling things i went through his i went through his phone book and i looked at all of the numbers and i found all of these little like coded words and i found all of the things that looked a little bit suspicious and like, why why was he why was he so you know on the sly about it i mean um he had he had basically he he had had it been caught having uh, loads of affairs over and over again and my mum had always said to him no the next time that's it it's over oh no the next time that's it it's over and this time I was 17 it was like 1997 and I was 17 and and so my mum couldn't see a point of trying to keep the family together anymore you know she was like I don't want to be with him anymore he's he's just he's just all about himself so she wanted to get out of there and there's a there's a load of histories there was a load of histories in my family really complicated things that i didn't know about uh, with my family uh, my mum sat me down one day and told me some things about her life that i had never i i i still can't you know i can't uh, say by proxy that that happened to her throughout her life and she um, was kind of eccentric as i've heard you told her before she was kind of a eccentric with religion and spirituality yeah, yeah. kind of mixed in in a bunch of weird ways kind of thing. yeah most most definitely she 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 had had um she she in in the sealed knot she had had a friend who she got really 
really close with. She was a really nice girl. She was a sad girl, but she was really nice. And she did a tarot reading for her. And this must have been about like 79 or something. She did a tarot reading for her and and it came up bad. And the girl killed herself like a week or two later. And uh, my mum never forgave herself. So she was she was like in denial about her affinity for this so, so I, we had all of these books all uh, around but we didn't have like uh, any like it was just church and she didn't look at the rest of the stuff after that until the divorce happened and then when the divorce happened it kind of like just opened up and then she started going to psychic readers all over the place um how did you feel about about that i mean uh, being some of it was world. Some of it's really interesting because I find it, I, I I think it's a bit of a hit and miss. Like for them, it's a bit of hit and miss. There, there's a load of, there's a load of people out there who are of course scammers and, and they say loads of things and sometimes they're right about something. And at one point, place she had turned up she had taken my auntie along and there was a a a guy who who claimed to be psychic and talked about my uh auntie's dead daughter who had died just uh uh, like a year or two or three before Uh, it was devastating she was 18 you know she was uh, the princess of the family and uh and 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 that 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 really like i think that sparked my mum to be like look for all of her ways away from uh the bad relationship and other things into spirituality and she started uh, attending spiritual church uh which of course people who who who, who are in the know uh, people who whose family attend such things they know they call them spooky church <laughs> did you go check out the spiritualist church because it's a big <laughs> deal in uh mm-hmm. in the uk you know in here even in in uh where i live in california i was tempted- never went uh, no, I, I used to. I listened to a couple of the 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 readings that she got, the private readings, but I never went to spiritualist church. And there was, I mean, there was a few reasons behind that. One of them was, I remember my mum saying, "Listen, we at the spiritualist church, I've offered to uh, uh to to put together the compilation for the music, the hymns we're going to be singing, of course, their version of hymns." And uh, and uh, what was it again? It was um Robbie Williams Angels. And uh, uh, I just called to say I love you by Stevie Wonder. <laughs> and she had me put it down on a tape. And then I gave the tape to her and she went in and, and they played that at every session. They played the same two songs. I just called to say I love you. And I just, I, just like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do, I would be laughing. I would be in hysterics the entire time. So I kind of left, let, left that. I, you know, I don't, I, I don't like to poo poo anything I can't disprove. This unfalsified. I mean, the evidence is pretty overwhelming for after death communication in terms of uh, scientifically, like we've interviewed a bunch of people that you you can take that to science, you could do a quadruple blind study, you can get people and sit them down and not have the people do it and score it independently. I had some done all that stuff. Yeah, I had some freaky occurrences happen. Yeah, Uh, it's not about that. I mean, what it's about and the way it connects to all this other stuff we're going to talk about is that you know, this has been kind of one of my things is what's slipping through the cracks here is the metaphysical uh, part of this, you know, Prometheus, where Bell and Saga, right? And uh, Kim Kardashian. And, you know, so some of these people are trying to tap into that energy. And we can say whether that energy is real or not, you can be mm-hmm. agnostic about that. But you cannot deny the fact that they are in the belief that there is this alternative energy that will aid them you know that's what pizzagate was about you know and stuff we, we talk also- about we talk about energy upon a low like level of intelligence normally i mean the, the human beings in general because i mean when we talk about we, when we talk about like sexual compromise cases and things like this i really find i, I i'm i'm bringing out um a five part series that kind of goes back through it, it it it's a lot of things that happened in the 50s and 60s and no one's truly examined really well that's like the takeover from being normal people then having their establishment 
agents taken over by gangland members, then taken over by in- those guys taken over by intelligence, and a load of people just died in the wake, and then that led to the downfall of the British government and and naughty women inside uh, Kennedy's bedchamber. And there's one guy in there, of course, in in amongst these stories uh, that they come from the Profumo affair, uh, the downfall of the British government in in, in the early sixties. There's one guy, Stephen Ward, Society Osteopath. He was kind of the guy who was hung out to dry, uh, taken to court, and eventually took an overdose. Oh, took an overdose and and died while suicided. In right? Yeah, yeah, completely, completely. I mean, it, it, he 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 had known some of the most important and powerful and influential people and uh, uh, not only in government but also in the intelligence services and he had put himself about and he had put himself in the right places and he was a really interesting person if you actually read a lot of the testimony about uh, people who had experiences especially girls who had sexual experiences because you you talk about all of these different uh, girls that went off to these different people uh, around the time so, uh, Stephen Ward would go and chat up a load of girls and then say well do you want to meet my mate he's a politician who's got loads of money and they'd go, all right then, and then they'd toddle off down the road, and he'd introduce them to his mate, who's a politician or whoever else, you know. Um, but when they had a relationship with him, it was completely different. Often when they went off with other people, they had these weird stories, you know, spankings, sex with animals, all these sort of weird things all around. But with Stephen Ward, he was about um, exchanging energy, so he was about very much about, uh, and I, I, I anybody who understands more than just having sex with somebody else, knows that once you uh, lay down with anybody else, once you uh, connect with someone, you go into a point where you can literally just like be next to each other and exchange this feeling that that, that, uh, that, that grows and expands. And it's not talked about when you're talking about sexual compromise cases. We talk sex, 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 but there's so much more to the energy that comes out of a human being and the different manifestations of it and the nuances between it and how it affects people and how it changes people's lives, changes people's perception of what's good about a bad. That's almost too complicated to approach from the way we are. I'll, I'll tell you one woman that I, I reference all the time because I talked her on the show and it's it's like I, I wrote this book a few years ago called Why Evil Matters. And the premise of the book is we don't deal with evil, you know, it's either Evil is a social construct. Evil doesn't exist. There's no such thing as consciousness. You're a biological robot in the meaningless universe. Or I'll tell you what evil is. Let me pull out my Bible, you know, and, and here it is. So I interviewed this woman called Annika Lucas, and she was, you know, you've had a horrific childhood. My childhood was was not perfect, but nothing, nothing like that. Annika goes, goes a level deeper, uh, uh, basically an insane mother who sold her to uh, as a sex slave at six years old in Belgium. And remember the Dutro thing? I, I did a bit of research on it. It's quite amazing. Uh, yeah, I got, I, I, if you want to know a couple of little tidbits of what I know, then. Well, well yeah, well, and, and likewise, because, you know, one of the things they know about the Dutro case is, you know, he goes to jail. And while he's in jail, the little kids, you know, that he has locked up in cages die because they're not getting fed and they go and you can find pictures on the internet of these kids. So I'm talking to Annika and uh, unbelievable uh, kind of experience, trauma, uh, kind of a yogi. I'm a yogi. She's into that now and has used that as part of her healing kind of thing. But the the thread there that's, that's interesting is at some point I go, well, is that but you know, is this satanic? And she goes, yes, it is satanic. Now I'm not a Christian, Johnny. I I mean, I was raised Christian, but I I don't believe that satanic in the biblical sense gets us there. But there are these people that it's not about energy exchange. It's about Mm -hmm. them specifically Mm -hmm. trying to do something. And you know what I tie it to? If I can, to jump around here, because I really want to get here and I want to make sure we get there. (laughs) So let me pull this up because we could talk about this freaking for an hour. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. In your uh, Schwab family values kind of thing. It's a brief history of the Jewish persecution in Ravensburg, which where Uncle Klaus is from. One of the things that jumped out at me 
is blood libel. Do, do you want to do you want to tell people what fucking the craziness that of <laughs> what blood libel is? Back in the day, people were very crazy about stuff. So when when something happened where people started accusing other people of being a witch or uh, of some uh, worshiping some sort of like um, black magic, uh, it was done with loads of these words that we don't really use nowadays. Uh, but with with in this case in particular, they were saying that the Jewish people were um, sacrificing babies uh, to obviously their Molech or their 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 sort of devil. That's what specifically this blood libel was about. Here's where you didn't take it. That I want to take it and see where you go. Is that one? It's about the Jews. And then number two, this is rebooted by the Nazis, right? So this is like 13th century. They're going, hey, the Jews are doing this crazy thing because it's already been done for hundreds of years. We've been sacrificing kids all the time. The thematic element that they're building on here is not new, that we're going to get together and we're going to, you know, to Moloch or whoever, we're going to take these mm-hmm. we're gonna take these little kids and we're going to sacrifice them. But now they're directing it at the Jews. And we want to pick up on it like it's a Nazi thing. It's not. It's a Christian thing. It's a, it's a, a Martin Luther thing. Have you ever read what Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant church, the guy who goes and nails the guy who the, translates the Bible and the like pain of death and on for like they, they threaten the same with Tyndall and translating the Bible into, uh, to English. So these were like, groundbreaking times where people were doing the things that they weren't allowed to do like so but but so deconstruct that for a second so uh martin luther goes and actually has a chance to read the bible and says hey all this shit that the catholic church is telling us it isn't in there so he goes and says hey everyone should be exposed to the bible but what the bible tells us is that I don't want people to take this the wrong way. It tells us what I think is this completely false narrative about this historical Jesus figure that really doesn't add up. But the way that story comes down is that these Jews are the bad guys from Jump Street. They're the ones who killed uh, Jesus, right? So they went to Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate said, hey man, the guy looks good to me, but if you Jews want to kill him, the stain is on you forever. This is the origin of the whole Jewish thing. Yeah, and if we yeah, don't get yeah, back yeah. to that, and if we don't get back to that narrative and look at whether that narrative is true, and we have archaeological evidence that it isn't true, as a bunch of, as along with the fact that anyone who's looked at it logically says, hey, there's no historical evidence to suggest well, that. Well, Josephias, Josephias, I Joseph- think, uh, oh, jo- I, 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 if I'm pronouncing his name right, um, Josephus. But- Josephus. Well, there's there's a couple of people who, around a certain time in the the, the uh, Roman world, decided to adopt part of Christianity into their own images for their own sort of brand. And and I think uh, he's one of the p- people who helped color that. Uh, no, I mean this is kind of my thing, one of my things. But Josephus is a really interesting character. Do you know any of the story of Josephus? You just a couple of little bits. Just a so, couple of so little just, bits. So Josephus is uh he's Jewish and he's a general. And mm-hmm. uh Vespasian that who is gonna become the next Caesar is sent over to clean up Judea, right? And he lands in Galilee. And Galilee happens to be where Josephus is the general. So one thing leads to another. This is Josephus's account. The, the, I'll, I'll kind of give a little hint here. Josephus can only be understood as a propaganda agent for the Romans. Now, I've mm-hmm. had leading historians come on, and, biblical historians and just regular historians, PhDs come on and, and verify that. No one argues with that. Josephus begins to write this. He t- He's basically turned. He's flipped, right? So Vespasian comes in and says, hey, uh, you're going to die or you're going to help me. I mean, that's our interpretation of it. The way Josephus spins it in his story is that, no, he goes into a cave and everyone commits suicide. And then he has this revelation. And his revelation is that Vespasian is the Messiah that the Jewish people have been waiting for. 
Yeah. And he actually writes this down. This is in War of the Jews, the most famous book that Josephus wrote. And what so many scholars rely on is the history of that time, because even though they'll all admit it's propaganda, it's the best account we have of what happens. So he's not inventing Christianity at this point. What he's doing is he's trying to mess with Judaism just as a, as a psyop, right? So he's telling the Jews, of which he's one, that your religion, you're waiting for this Messiah. Well, I tell you what, one of your proverbs actually predicts that Vespasian will be the Messiah, and here he is. So it, 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 it's, it, it gets much, much more complicated because then a few hundred years later, we have Constantine. And, mm. and you know the funny thing, not to digress too far, but you're, the reason we know a lot of this stuff about Josephus is because we have the Arch of Titus. You can go to Rome and you can see the freaking Arch of Titus. It's still there. It's this big rock and it shows all these Romans and they got the Star of David and they have all this gold and silver and stuff like that, that they've, checked, they've taken from Judea, Judea with the sacking of Judea. And then 300 years later, we have the Arch of Constantine. But you know, the, the thing about Constantine, what they say is that Constantine, this famous story is Constantine is the, the father of the Christian church, if you believe kind of the narrative. And mm -hmm. Constantine comes to this river crossing and he's gonna have this big battle. You know this story, you know? And he sees a cross in the sky and he sees that as a image and a, his conversion happens and he went, wins the battle. And then he says, okay, we should convert. And he mm -hmm. converts the empire to Christianity. That's not true. You could just go through the archaeology. There's no crosses on the Arch of Constantine. There's no crosses. Mm -hmm. and well, most he... of the, most of these, uh, I mean, propaganda has been. Way, people think that we are different, yes. so much different now than we were a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, and everybody's motivated. We might have all of these gadgets and technology and boxes and luggage piled up all over the place, but all of it is pretty meaningless when you get right down to the brass tacks. You've got only the ability to look better to someone, to also create an idea that you're indistinguishable from magic, basically, that you're you're worth investing in and that they should give you all of their stuff. And that's what we've got from history immemorial is people who are trying to brand what does that say about the reset one of the angles i was going to take on this interview is that your work inadvertently pulled me out of the abyss with the great reset which is pretty impossible to do because it's so dark and what they're doing is so obvious and so revealed but you know what pulls me out a little bit is just the crazy humanness of klaus schwab and Henry Kissinger, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I heard your excellent interview with Greg from Higher Side Chats, and you were talking about screwed up families, you know, particularly Klaus Schwab, and uh, you know how his family background. And but it's human. It's like I yep. get it, and and that also on another level, it's like uh, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Is that? Tell me this. Is that the worst? freaking marketing slogan in history i mean you couldn't you couldn't shop that and, and come up with the worst thing that you could go and now they've tried to scrub it from the internet but it won't scrub because nothing can really be scrubbed the fact all, that they, they the fact it, that they can make that kind of mistake that kind of misstep is a ray of hope the fact that henry kissinger is a bona fide freaking world war two war okay hero. okay okay hero. wait one, one, one second one second because kissinger there yeah he 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 created like the idea of really really fundamentally of limited warfare perpetual limited warfare and he discovered that you have to create something that explodes and is is dangerous and kills to be able to get along with all of this other stuff over here while people are distracted over there. And in a sense, that's what Klaus Schwab uh, is and his gang do with a sentence like, you'll own nothing and be happy. It's so abusive and horrible that you start from the bottom it's rung, trolling. I think. It's yeah, trolling. It's, well, well, to an extent, but it's making people think, no, I want more than that. And then they're instantly in this frame of mind of more than that is better. You know, it instantly flips into, oh, I want to own more than nothing and be happy. 
There you go. That's yeah, what I'm it, have. It's, it's it's trolling, it's flexing, and it's signaling. And I got those from you, and I didn't see that before. I, I modified them slightly. But one that, that you pointed out, first of all, it's signaling. You know, I'm in fucking Davos, Switzerland. Hamburgers are $50 a piece or 50 <laughs> You know what I mean? There's no I will own nothing kind of thing. It's, it, that's, but I'm signaling to my people that, hey, this is how we talk to these people. This is what they mean. But it's also flexing in that same way. It's saying... I can get away with this. We can just rub it in their face. It's flexing. I can do this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's also trolling because you like to troll. We all like to troll. We all like to get a reaction out of people. And he likes to get a reaction. I think if you're not very good at comedy, you you end up trolling. And so most of the people who want power aren't very good at comedy and usually end up being trolls. <laughs> they may go together. Well, you know, the other place I was going with Kissinger is – like you didn't go all the way there but if you go into the background of kissinger freaking world war ii hero i mean legitimate mm -hmm. war hero not yeah like yeah, any, yeah not like any bullshit like legitimate battle of the bulge you know and yeah before yeah, the battle yeah, of the bulge, yeah before battle of the bulge he carries a gun into battle he's there you know and, and i would say is, i would say totally psychologically scarred from being right in the center of a load of battles and afterwards he's the guy who's kicking in doors and looking for the nazis like well, he's heading up like groups after the war going he's project, pa in, he's project yeah. paperclip he's uh, project much, paperclip much later, but right at the end of the war the first people through your door was henry kissinger and 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 his boys if you were uh generals and stuff hiding away they exactly so so you're there. gestapo we're gonna find out we're gonna find out but but very quickly your project paperclip and mm -hmm. but this is a 21 year old kid this is a kid who leaves germany three days before crystal knock i mean you can't forget that either and he comes over to New York, and it's this segregated thing. You, you're Jewish. You walk on the other side of the street because those kids will beat you up, you know. And he doesn't speak English. I mean, there's so many things to admire about this guy, but he goes totally dark. I mean, we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk back about you and how you wind up with Chile. But man, he don't land. Uh, you know, you're Henry Kissinger. You don't make any stops in uh, Santiago, right? Because isn't he still a wanted criminal down there? War criminal. <laughs> yeah. I, you, listen, he's a criminal. He should be a criminal in every single country on but, Earth. But he was tried. He was tried in in Chile, wasn't he? Or they tried yeah, him? Yeah. I, I I don't know too much about the. I know. I I the last thing I looked up about Kissinger in South America was him helping to fix the argentinian world cup how, how did you wind up with chile in in chile and and how did uh how did whitney wind up in chile too how did you both well Whit whitney was here whitney was here first she had uh she she had started to make a life down here and we met and we went to doing into i mean we're basically into the same sort of stuff completely like not only writing but how we research and then all of the other things in life we get on really well with so we just hit it off really quickly and it was a case that covid broke out uh covid broke out and all of the process started and it came to a point where we realized that I, if I stayed in Britain, I was going to be stuck in Britain. So I went over to Chile and uh, I, through COVID, I've been kicked out of the country at times where I've not been allowed in, is better to say, um, where they, they pretended their embassy was open in London um, and they wouldn't let me back in. But basically, uh, I, I'm applying for temporary residence, uh, residency down here at the moment because the last time I went back to Britain, I was just... I was so disappointed. Everybody's in a state of shock there, it seems to me. They're all walking around with this dumb look on their face going, oh, no, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine over and over again and hoping that everything's fine. But the stories I was hearing were, were people who just hadn't come to terms with what had just happened over the previous two years. The kids were out of control um there was fires going on in the park outside the 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 house i was staying at um and i i'd lived there for like 
eight, nine years beforehand, and it'd always been a really nice place. And it just turned into a place where gangs of kids were roaming around and being nerdy wells, as we say, being bad, being like I was when I was young. And uh, <laughs> uh, but but the thing is, is Cardiff isn't Thatcher's uh, Britain anymore. You know, it's not. It's not the same. It's, it's, it, it 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 went up in the world a little bit. You know, it, it got a little bit of prestige, a bit of money invested in it, and uh, and and it was really sad to see. So Chile has just become a better place, a much better place to hang out, much better place. So, in, anything particular about Chile, or how did you wind up there? You just uh, me and Whitney. We just uh, we hit it off. So. Uh, we live down in Chile now. We got a kid. Um, we uh, live amongst the volcanoes, so life is pretty groovy down here. You know, it's just just seems like the right place. Just you guys live like in right you live in Santiago? No, 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 no. Because that's oh, a pretty rough. Oh that's God. a pretty rough place. Oh. I went. I did. Um, I did a an audit there recently. Um, when I couldn't go into America, when Whitney did her book tour around America with a couple of platforms, I, I was like, uh, I, I stuck in in Chile because I couldn't leave, or I'd have to have all of these tests to come back. Um, so I went right up first of all to Santiago, and I did some police auditing. So I got out the the, the camera and I went round and I I looked for police to video. Uh, to see how they reacted to the the whole uh, process of being filmed, uh, which is what police auditing is about, and uh, and I ended up getting uh, attacked by a couple of tramps uh, while I was there. There was a couple of tramps. Who uh, you're, you're you're on your way to getting thrown out of there, aren't you? Yeah, I know, I know straight away. Uh, but then I went up to Arica, which is right at the north of Chile by the Bolivia Peru border, and uh, and I stayed up there for a couple of weeks, and it's like the most rundown. Uh, uh, rife with drugs no one's employed the beach was beautiful but completely empty because it'd been completely decimated over covid and uh and i i walked around and i uh i videoed around there for a bit and that was a really like whew, huts up on the hills like you know people don't have anything they don't have any not not two pennies to rub together as they'd say um so the north of of Chile is much different than uh, the mid and the south because, of course, when you go south, you get down to the penguins and Patagonia, and right, that's right. You know, you've gone too far if you see penguins. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 my my. But in the middle, you've got some really nice places, loads of lakes. Uh, you've got a run of volcanoes, so there's a volcano near us where which is always smoking. It looks beautiful. Uh, it's a really nice place to live. Um, and it, it, it's a bit of a, you know, when you have things like uh, volcanoes and stuff, you've got all round, year round ski, ski holidays and exploring holidays. So you've got loads of tourists around here and uh, that attracts lots of funny people, but lots of like nice little restaurants and things. There's uh, Chile's is pretty, it's, the people are, the people are interesting, but they seem really like they're outside all of the troubles of the world. And we like that, but in the same way, sometimes when COVID happened, every man, woman, and child was covered with a mask and looking down and scared about, like, did not want to have to argue. Pinochet, man, Pinochet. What kind of what kind of trauma does that yeah, put into crazy. a culture, right? Yeah, and that's crazy. and that's that's Henry. That's Henry's. Candy work, Henry's right? boy, yeah. Well, well, he he did a lot of like. There's a lot of in different parts of the world. Henry Kissinger uh, supported different regimes and pretended that he wasn't sometimes. So, like in Pakistan, they pretended that they were tough on Pakistan. At the same time, they were helping Pakistan with everything. And Kissinger was setting up with Jack Galbraith for Benazir Bhutto to be trained uh, through Harvard and um, and eventually put into power, where she would act like she was anti-American, but in actual fact, she was. And what happens to her? Anybody who works with Kissinger uh, for long enough gets uh, the boot eventually, I'm sure, apart from Schwab. Well, you know, I, I, there's so many ways to go with this that I haven't even gone. But you, you know, one of the things I wonder is if you look at Kissinger and you look at that awesome article that you did, Dr. Klaus Schwab, or how the CRF taught me to stop worrying and love the bomb, which is right out of Dr. Strangelove 
and you identify the guy who really is Dr. Strange Love, and it's not Kissinger, which is interesting because a lot of people used to think it was uh, Kissinger. And uh, it, 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 this is – give people the, the, the thumbnail sketch on this because when we're talking about Pinochet and we're talking about this stuff that he does in the CIA, it's not as crazy – as it is normally portrayed and it particularly plays into the maybe not as crazy part of the world economic forum not to say that the world economic forum isn't evil of a first order but it's like there's like this twisted crazy logic to it that is kind of revealing in, in a way that you do it give us the the quick thumbnail sketch of this okay well well it's, what's really interesting about um kissinger is that he uh takes people and he gives them the right people to help him go along but in a sense everything kissinger does isn't kissinger's really uh and in this case it, there was a um a seminar harvard's international seminar that was originally set up by william yandel elliott who was a uh, advisor to six presidents and was a uh, a real big uh, cfr grandee council on foreign but this, this is cia from jump street yeah, 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 a hundred percent. I mean, by nineteen sixty-seven, uh, internationals, uh, Kissinger's international seminar was outed. Humphrey Dorman himself from Harvard had to go into the Harvard Crimson and publish. Oh, look, yes, um, between nineteen sixty 1960 and nineteen sixty-six, Kissinger's international seminar was funded by the Farfield Foundation, uh, by the American Friends for the Middle East, um, and by the Asian Foundation. Uh, but they don't mention the first ten years, and that's really Limited. important. Limited hangout, total limited yeah. hangout. Yeah, there. yeah. And as soon as it got exposed, because it was about to be exposed by newspapers, so they just came out with it. Now, what I released the other day, uh, Guido Goldman, the CFR, and uh, and the German Marshall Fund, um, really explores much further onto that. So the the moment that 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 got uh, exposed, they they went away and said, "Well, we got to find another way to run leadership courses," which was what Harvard's international seminar, Kissinger's international seminar, was. It was a young global leadership program uh one of the first that america had run soviets have been running them for years run from 1950 to 1967 1972 the german marshall fund is created and eventually you get the marshall uh memorial fellowship you get the tiln leadership network you get uh a, a other ones lab, leadership lab you get other ones come up and that was again set up by kissinger uh, and he put Guido Goldman and Stanley Hoffman, who were both uh, underlings, po Kissinger protégés, working at the Harvard University, Guido Goldman especially, um, put into the position uh, of the German Marshall Fund. And they were given a very special assistant, which is a woman called Abby Collins, who's not mentioned in the first articles I've written about the international seminar, but she ran the international seminar. She completely run it. At the end, she was the, the woman, she was an Asian American who basically ran it for Kissinger once it was completely off the ground. So the last years, especially while they were being funded by CIA conduit, it was by Abby Collins. And she went straight over to the German Marshall Fund afterwards, basically, and they continued the same thing, which still runs today and leads on. Here's the part I want you to draw out, the kind of big picture part, is that th this crazy mutual destruction kind of thing yeah the way you lay it out it actually kind of makes sense until you kind of cross correlate it with the fact that we almost blew each other the freaking up we did i mean it yeah, almost yeah, yeah, happened yeah. it was it got crazy it got really crazy uh cfr put in loads of working groups while this uh international seminar started running the cia were doing loads of things so they were starting off their coups over in in uh, the middle east uh against soviet uh, uh, uh like infiltration and they were doing other things but they were they and they were starting off the seminar but they were also concentrating on the nuclear arms race and these people were really really worked out that the, the 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 soviets could just launch a bomb and everybody's dead and the soviets are like oh god the americans could launch a bomb and everybody's dead so so they were both 
really scared. Everybody had all this propaganda, this duck and cover sort of stuff coming out at this from the TV screens, from the newspapers constantly. And they had they had really pushed up the rhetoric. And in 1957, when um, nuclear war and foreign policy got released from the CFR working group that Henry Kissinger released it, and it kind of said, okay, what would be better than all-out nuclear war is that we have this slow perpetual warfare. Let the guys in Cardiff go out in the alley after a few pints and mm -hmm. they'll get it out of their system and it's then true. you know we can go on and tomorrow we'll do the same thing that that is a that is a thought and with with um herman khan he was like well they're not gonna fire on us we're not gonna fire on them you know for every every finger pushing down on the button is like 14 hands pulling that finger up there's so many safety mechanisms and it's just very unlikely that we're going to have this but it's like a, a stalemate so that kind of led people to realize that henry kissinger's uh, like previous four years before uh summation that oh we should maybe have this perpetual limited warfare that goes on all the time is much more likely to be the route everything's going to go from this point on um and and yeah but the idea that we could all just destroy us uh, e each other and herman khan is an extremely interesting figure um worked for the hudson institute uh heading up the hudson institute uh, really funded a lot by the rand corporation um he wrote a he worked for the State Department between 1966 and 1968, and he wrote this amazing paper, two papers at the time. One was an ancillary document about educating leaderships outside the normal university uh, um, uh, processes, so like a Young Global Leaders course. Uh, but also his more public document was called the, Net, uh, the Year 2000, and it was looking at all the technology that could possibly uh, be be discovered uh, in the net, uh, up until the year 2000. Something Thing that Klaus does when he becomes, you know, because Klaus, Klaus is, a is, yeah, he's introduced to Herman Kahn as Herman Kahn is writing this, this young technocrat. And I feel that the, the Kissinger knew that the technocrats were going to be, the, he, of course, he knew, they all knew the technocrats would be the future power. On a totally kind of uh, straight up uh, kind of level way, which you also play out, you know, like this stuff is really dark. So I don't want to kind of, uh, uh, it's not like I'm trying to sugarcoat these people. I'm just trying to uh, help us understand them better. Because I, I think your thing about if anyone takes out trolling, flexing, signaling, and just says, is there any truth to that? It softens this thing up a lot, I think, in a way that we can kind of more digest and handle that these guys are human. If you can look at the human in a very negative way i mean like criminal but, but, human but still human but the other thing i was going to say is like you do that with schwab when you say he takes over daddy's business but he's kick-ass good at it you know and yeah, one of the things yeah. he sees from harvard and all the rest of that is this technology is coming and we're going to apply it in our business and we're going to make a shitload of money because we're going to make a better we're going to make a better business because we're on top of it we're doing good stuff we're doing harvard business school kind of stuff Hey, Klaus knows that wherever he is at this point, he's got at that point he's getting loads of he's got loads of degrees, loads of extra degrees on top. Where he just turns up at a place and suddenly gets to given a degree. He's he's invited to Kissinger's international seminar, so it must have been that he had such a really uh, amazing amount of uh, qualifications. He's got a ton of degrees, but he's also smart. I mean, he's on he's on his game too. Right? Yeah, no, no, Schwab, Schwab's a really intelligent. Uh, guy he's got all of these degrees he, he's going places um and he gets invited to this seminar which is a real big deal um because it, it puts him on the world stage so it doesn't matter which companies he's in to schwab schwab's going to make a big thing himself wherever he is he's going to be successful and he had learned that he was interested he was a technocrat from the off and i think that's partially because kissinger and other people said right you're a technocrat technocracy is the future you go get your prize and your prize is this world that no one else is aware of yet. You're looking, when I go troll through the archives, I'm reading these uh, stories where, look, this computer can come up with this answer. Oh, this computer can come up with this answer. Then it's uh, suddenly the computer's revolutionized financial industry. Then it's revolutionized the world with the internet and internet commerce and information highway. And then it's something else.
was. And they were already aware of this because of Herman Kahn's research. And Kissinger had given Herman Kahn and John Kenneth Galbraith as mentors for Schwab. So Schwab already had the person with him that was going to take him to that place where he was going to be at the king of the technocrats. And I think that that, that crown is going to... Uh, he can't live forever at the moment. But but it, it maybe maybe that what they really want and what he's talked about and what other people around him has talked about is storing your consciousness up into the cloud, and you know all of these ideas that come with the transhumanist. So he's become from a technocrat to a pure transhumanist, and I think that the the uh, he doesn't matter how many crimes he's committed or how many things he does wrong. Klaus Schwab is going to get away with it because when he dies, a new person who will be the anti-Klaus but will agree with nearly everything Klaus Schwab says and does will be the person to take over, you know, to take over the dream of all of these people who see this technology around. I think Maybe. Klaus Schwab fitted, a, fitted a, 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 like a, a certain era. He was the right man for that certain era, and he did a really good job. Maybe here's here a couple of things I want to bounce off you as we kind of eventually will run out of time here. The clock is moving quickly, but um, I see some wrinkles in the playbook. I, I heard you on uh, higher side chats, and I think you made a pretty compelling case that I often make, which is like, if you want to count these guys down, you're like, they haven't even begun to pull out any of the trick plays. They're just running the basic, yeah, you know, the yeah. basic stuff at this point. But, but, but there's different stuff that doesn't line up. Your piece on the Russian thing, let me pull that up, okay? But what, what blew me away here is uh, Putin's in the club, right? He's a global leader guy, but now he's out of the club. Now he's getting scrubbed from the club because of Ukraine doesn't exactly fit with the, the program that they're trying to run. And it starts revealing maybe the Cardiff thing in the, in the alley where, you know, now suddenly a couple of my mates come up and like, no, bro, we stand together on this thing. And one guy says, no, we're not going to play that way. So the globalist thing kind of breaks down. What you play out in this article, which I'll try and bring some pieces into this conversation so it has some context, but like they are like doing a flip where they're taking the World Economic Forum crazy reset stuff and they're doubling down on it. They're taking it way mm -hmm. to the next level of we're just going to surveil everyone and we're Russia and we can get away with this. And meanwhile, the Schwabians and the CIA, which is this really about USA, USA, they're pumping the brakes and they're going, whoa, 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 wait a minute now. So this isn't part of the program, is it? I mean, that's my read of it. Um, I think that it's a case that if you, uh, as a nation, as a people, uh, as a Russians in general, have been constantly being undermined by this West, and it's got to a point where, I mean, you had floods of NGOs around every single country that surrounds your country, and it's taken, they've taken political control in nearly every single one of those countries, and you've got no, it's like, you've got the cultural borders, that's all you've got left. Uh, and they're all frayed and they're at breaking point and they're pushing further and further. Well, you've got to realize that you're on the losing side and you've been on the losing side for a long time because you haven't been watching what the other guys are doing. You've been watching. There's just nothing you can do about it. Yeah. I mean, it's about it's about controlling the currency. And we own the currency, USA, USA. If we want to continue to own the currency, USA, USA. So now I, when Russia says, well, maybe you don't own the currency. Maybe I can get together with China and Brazil and India and maybe we can come up. That ain't going to fly. But the part that I want you to particularly hone in on, which this article does, is they're on board with the World Economic Forum technocratic craziness of all this stuff. Completely, and completely. I and mean, they, they, but, they, that, but now they're now they're on the outs. So how do you do that? How do they they take it and they go, oh, this is great. We have more we have more surveillance cameras than anybody. If we can lock down all our people, we can take this to the max. Now, what happens when they become your enemy? I think there's a glimmer of hope there where the globalist thing kind of breaks down a little bit, where you kind of are pointing at them like North Korea and going, hey, nobody wants that. Let's make sure we're we're not that. So by Russia going over the top, is there a wedge in the globalist agenda? 
So with Russia, what they've done is they've they like the the guy who uh, runs Spurbank. I forget his name. He's a guy. He's a guy who's basically pushed forward the same thing that Elon Musk is talking in America, like the everything sort of app. Have everything on one app. All your bank, all your bills, all your shopping, everything you do on this one thing. You don't get to go outside this app. That's the start of like real real serious social control, and and it's been snuck in over here. And I see that as cultural. In a lot of cultures, they have to sneak these things in in china and russia you don't have to be so sneaky because the people know you're sneaking so you just stomp around and they're not in control anyway so the the, they're they're trying to get ahead of what the americans want to do and what the west wants to do they're trying to get ahead of them now if they do that could be a winner that could be a winner but this society they're creating is one which is uh, everybody looking inwards and not outwards. And that doesn't necessarily suggest that there's going to be massive global war or conflict because everybody's more likely to be stuck in their one place and people not wanting people to move around and would want other people probably to be scared of the people who are next door, the different countries next door, and just keep in that fear where their information... And what we see in Russia and what we see in China is a race to what the American model uh, was mapped out by these people in the past, by these technocrats, like the Western model. And we see a lot of the fight between them is now now like uh, battles to do the same thing first and that's why i think ukraine's happened because it's got down to the point where friction's rubbing together the the, the, the that's the breaking point ukraine has been flooded with more ngos than any other country in the region they knew that it, it had really strong russian re, uh, uh, regions and would would incite uh, a split a potential civil war, um, and it's perpetual warfare. You're not seeing proper warfare over there. If you're seeing proper warfare, Russia's taken Ukraine over in a week and a half and just rolled in. Or if you see proper warfare, that is what you would see, and you're not seeing that at all. You're seeing they take a bit and they lose it again, and over here they take a bit and they lose it again, and that's Kissinger's perpetual warfare, and. They are all playing under the same the same game, but they're all competing still. But the winner, the taking all, isn't actually all. Globalism, just like the first one to get to globalism, will probably have a little bit of say on how it goes in the future and that it will be beneficial to them. But in actual fact, they don't know either. They're just trudging towards the thing they think they need to trudge towards because that's what they've been told and they're in the mindset and everything around them Stalin that's what the other people are doing so they're playing a game and that game may be destructive for us down here um but it's a slow process it's going to go on for a long time what do you think of this what do you think of this yeah i i i i see what what and this is I, I've talked with a few people in the independent media and behind the scenes as well, and at most of the, the the feeling is that we're 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 going to see the thing that we're going to see next is some sort of fake war between countries because all of this stuff, bro, this ain't fake. Some, I talk about I, fake nuclear attack. I'm talking maybe, about this going maybe to, or, or I, I, see China. I I, yeah. I'm a I'm an AI guy, artificial intelligence guy. So I I was in the PhD program for artificial intelligence. I oh. left to start an AI company. I started an AI company way back in the day when we were doing expert systems. Sold it, became a one percenter after a few uh, investments. I know this stuff and yeah. I don't know it. I don't know it like really, really know it, but I know it enough to kind of fumble through it. No, bro, the AI thing is real now, right? So the machine learning thing is real. You cut off these chips from China, it is, the oil embargo against Japan that starts World War II. I mean, mm -hmm. it is full on. Yeah, but you know, you know that no one wants to risk the biscuits. They know what it leads to. They have, it would lead to the thing that they had. And this is what always comes around in my mind. It always leads to when you look at it tactically, strategically, you'd end up saying, well, the only way is to make our own people afraid and believe everything like that's going on. And it doesn't really matter anyway. And we'll fake some form of big nuclear war going on 
on in the far off distance and everybody's crapping themselves because oh finally it's here and people don't realize that thousands of nuclear warheads have been detonated on this uh, earth already uh, well, take the nuclear thing out of it for a minute this is about our crypto versus everyone else's crypto right the united states currency is a crypto it's a fiat currency it's a crypto right but we want our crypto <laughs> it's our crypto we want to have control of it so mm -hmm. what this is about to me the thing with china and the thing with russia is don't mess with our crypto it's our crypto that runs the world right now as long as we can keep that in order so china stepped out of line a little bit and it's just pulling on the chain and going no yeah. you're not going to do that and but it's also cbdc's you know they're going to wipe this all away and if, well if, as long as as long as our crypto comes out on top from a united states standpoint these guys the, the guys we're talking about that's what they care about because so, as i see it the global thing is kind of show is, is kind of showing how it doesn't it doesn't really fit i mean klaus schwab is not really a globalist he's working for the freaking cia is what he's doing yeah he's yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a tech, US. yeah this is yeah this is a technocratic push to get to a, a technology arms race as quickly as possible really that's this technological arms race we're, we're we're in something that's been going on for a long time um once they once we got this is why the atomic age was so important once we got to that level of technology it was a real like signal to everybody in charge that all of the rest of the stuff is coming and very quickly because technological growth is basically exponential and if you can believe that if you truly believe that the route we're heading in 10 years is insane it's in crazy well what we're what we're going towards now i'm really intrigued to say and ask you well you know what do you think we're going are we going towards are we already at quantum enabled computer uh, computing are oh. we already at quantum computing i heard you mention that on the on the higher side chats and it's like I was like, bro, you, you, you have it. So a qubit is the way we measure quantum computing. And they've made uh, exponential growth in that. Just every month, they're increasing it. And they say that 100 qubit is more powerful than all the supercomputers in the so world right now. So what does that and all mean? What does that all mean? Every what single, it means. Every what it single means. CBDC, every single crypto, every single piece of technology that they're about to fight over, every nuclear well, it well, just becomes water. It well, becomes Johnny, nothing Johnny, in comparison. Well, Johnny, you, you put your finger on it on one of the articles you wrote. Again, brilliant. You, you brought this piece to the front about how th their first – which, which flies under the radar. No one was talking about this. You wrote this two years ago, which is security. So, right. So the first thing you want to do with your AI is hack everybody else. So you want to do promise software 10.0, where now everyone has their pants down and everyone can be looked at. I'll pull up that article for people after the show so they can see it, but it's phenomenal. But then you take that, you know what, what Elon has said, and here's another thing, like, I don't know what the, I don't know what to make of Elon, but I don't know how you read the Twitter files as anything other than a step forward. I mean, it's like, there's no, I don't see the alternative motive play there in I, revealing I, I, that. I but let me, let me, let me put that aside. Let me put that aside for a minute. Cause I want to get back to the, to the AI thing. What I sent you, and maybe I'll share this with people is I did the chat GPT thing on Johnny. And it's like, it's like a joke. It's like hilarious. But what it points out is something that Elon said, again, I'm not a big Elon guy, but you got, I think, take, take the complicated aspects of people and stuff like that. But what Elon said is we're all gonna need our own AI. And I think he's right because chat GPT is down the tank. It is down the tank in terms of its bias. You type in chat GPT and maybe I'll do this session and add it to the video. Great reset. It's like, I don't know. Hey, you do chat, there's a classic one. You do chat GPT, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Chat GPT says, I. I don't have, I don't know what that is. I don't have any. <laughs> I don't, uh, the AI, AI overlords don't, don't, don't. Exactly. What you're talking exactly. About I mean, you just, I mean, it's so, it's so transparent. All you have to do is go over to, go over to uh, Google and, you know, it's like, okay, here it is, Forbes, you know, here it is where they tried to scrub it, the original Twitter post, Wayback Machine. But then interestingly enough, like I said to you, go over to Ch uh, uh, Chatsonic, another AI, 
and type in the same thing and it lays it all out. It says, oh, this is, people were really upset about that because, you know, it's Orwellian and all the rest of it. So Elon looks pretty prophetic there. We're gonna need our own AI, our own machine learning to sort through the completely controlled. But if they're that far ahead of the curve, where, because the, the pitch they're making about the machine learning chat GPT is that, oh, it's it's out of control now. It's just, you know, doing its own thing. Well, apparently not. I mean, apparently they can rein it in and focus it to say what they want it to say. They can. Yeah, they can. I, 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 what we're seeing is lots of uh, phenomenon all over the place that look good look like the real thing and this oh, that is doesn't look good culture to me. and society no but i mean how it acts and how it how it how yes. it functions looks like it's working that's the same in culture as well as it is within technology it's like mimicking all over it seems like the bread and circuses moment of a civilization that's where i keep coming to the conclusion of we're coming to the end of ideas for this period of our human existence and we're going to need some other ideas if we're going to get over these I, doofus dicks I don't know whatever you want to call them that are running society with Elon Musk I've got to say out loud I, I, there's parts of me that like him and there's parts of me that hate him but I can tell you if you think he's a prophet it's only and this is to everybody is only because you haven't read certain things that if you had already read, you'd be like, oh, yeah, someone else said that, and someone else said that, and someone else said that, and someone else said that. What he is very good at is having people map out and game out and think himself, uh, analyze a situation, how it's going to play, play out eventually, especially when it comes to technology. He understands right on, it. Right on to all that, but but tell me this, like when we try and pin this stuff down, and this drives me nuts about the uh, conspiracy community, and I'm not tagging this at all on you, but like one of my goals is to kind of hold the conspiracy community uh, accountable and not just go into this, oh, Elon Musk, oh, did you see this? His parents, <laughs> oh, you know, bro, uh, you know, that's so bullshitty. What could explain the twitter files from a from a conspirator i don't see any okay, play okay. there i don't okay. see any play i'll tell you there. i'll tell you i'll tell you i'll tell you quite simply you've got a load of information that you need out you've got control of all and you're not elon musk this isn't elon musk this is someone else this is intelligence they are in control of everything. They've got their their men in here. Their men in there. They 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 can pull a string here, pull a string there, and they can uh, they get to a point where they end an operation, uh, or an operation is is going to be exposed. They are looking at all the chatter. They see all of the chatter all around, telling them that this is about to be exposed. No one else has seen that chatter because these guys are listening to lots of things and they decide we can expose it in whichever way we like. But the best way would be to flip the ownership of the company, make the people in the company that you want to keep running look like the heroes by releasing the information. You kind of whitewash it. It goes out of... it. it this happens. This is like intelligence resets i feel this with snowden as well and i do feel this with snowden that you got to a point where snow that operation needed was about to come out about to be known and you needed to release it so why not have somebody then you can put out that then becomes central to all of these people who are looking over there and not looking at what you're doing next because these programs are always stop gaps they always but Johnny, no one's looking program. over there no one's looking over there it in a way, that's evidence for what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, they oh, reveal evidence that, that they're th successful. Evidence well, that they're successful. But in you can't, their, you can't in have it both operations. ways. You, you can't have it both ways. You can't come out in with Twitter files and just uh, verify what has been rumored for this whole time, which is the the fourth estate just doesn't But everybody exist. knew. Everybody, every, every, knew. Everybody, everybody knew. Everybody knew. Everybody knew. I well, mean, the thing is, is all they're doing, that... all they're doing, is saving Twitter as an entity by having the people. But it get wasn't just, about Twitter. Pushed out I mean, really quickly. The, the 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 relevations really weren't about Twitter. They were about Google, Facebook, and how they all work in concert. Yeah. Con 
And what's happened? What's happened about Google or Facebook or all the rest of them? Yeah, Nothing. and and unless they decide that that point has ended and they need to refresh it, and they have someone else come in, and it's like a rebranding. So all I see with Elon Musk. Buying Twitter, all of a sudden doing the Twitter files. Everybody knows all the truth. Matt Taibbi and, and, and Vice, they're, they're, they're heroes. It's all a narrative that you've chosen. I mean, Taibbi, he's a guy who just like hates the conspiracy world. He hates, he, 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 he's he's not on uh, the side of the people, in my opinion. Uh, maybe, he's... maybe, but what, what, take your other thing. I mean, let's say, let's say, Elon does want to conquer the world from a business standpoint, which he clearly does. I mean, he's he works incredibly hard at Tesla and has made unbelievable uh, technology breakthroughs with that company. And I think it's total bullshit. I don't know why anyone would drive given to him. Given to him. Given to him. If he G- he's given to him, well, well, yeah, to, galore. Well, to, to you know, you know what? Yeah, like, look, I'm not a Twitter. I'm not a a, a, a Elon guy. I don't. But you know, no, no, PhD, PhD, or. Uh, Undergraduate degree physics, undergraduate uh, business degree uh, from Penn. Uh, you know, he's not oh, a slouch guy. Studying uh, Stanford. There's something there. There's something. No. Oh, Stanford, there's something he drops there. out. Right. Stanford, he drops out. He drops I out so, of a, he look, drops out wait. of a freaking PhD program. Yeah, in I know. Physics. I know. No, I know. He dropped out. But what's really interesting around that that phase is that it, there's like a, a couple of years which you don't get to see what he's done or you have no evidence of what he's done. Like no one has any evidence. And I looked through a load of articles and I found that saying that he had worked for Microsoft during that time. And I found a couple of rumors about what people have said. But there was loads of Microsoft leadership programs going. And Elon Musk, right, He's not in saying that he's probably not out for the best interest of humanity, uh, isn't necessarily saying he's not an intelligent guy, a super high functioning intelligence that I can't quite understand in in his realm. And he doesn't have a place. What would be the best interest of humanity? I mean that's back to Kissinger. Is is uh, mass uh, mutual nuclear destruction in the best interest of humanity? Uh, Kissinger kind of convinced us. Well, it maybe is is in a twisted way. It, it kind of is. I I just think that uh, this is the conspiracy stuff that kind of drives me nuts. I don't know what to make of of Elon Musk, but the openness. The two tur- that's Brandon, the, the his turning, mom's PR, his mom's turning, PR, she but it's was, real, he, but it's real. When, he turns oh, down the sure. deception. When it comes up to 96, 97, 98, his mother's working heavily on other people's branding, and at the same time, her company's working for her son's working for a very successful company that's going to that's projected to be able to be sold for lots of money. So he's in a situation where he needs all of that branding help, and she's very good at that. She's very good at that, and he's coming, he turned from being this geeky guy in school with some of the pictures you see of him is like he's like super geek uh, it's beautiful it's like almost it's almost like someone's who's drawn a character of him yeah like of what you'd expect a guy like that to be like well, when this he was bill younger. gates um yeah yeah but but he he really does have this uh carefully crafted persona that's so well it's so well for us i mean yes and it's 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 really nuanced and slight but it's there and if you put it all together well it's that nuance you can go watch him you can go watch him on joe rogan and 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 you can go watch him a million other places he'll conveniently smoke a blunt on there to show Uh, his humanity to the world i know i know carefully carefully i get it i get it i I get i get the cynicism i totally get the cynicism cynicism i understand it but the fact that we, we in the united states we we had the we had the president of the united states deplatformed from twitter yeah. Do you realize what a total mind fuck that is? To is, people still can't wrap their head around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and you're I, gonna I, say I, you're gonna say it's the end of an operation. I'm gonna say uh, it, 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 it's it's I don't see the purpose of no, ending that operation. It's not the end op- of an operation. It's the start of a new operation. Is what I'm saying. It's not the end of an operation. That operation is run really up above by exactly the same people. 
the, the Elon Musk gets his contracts, gets his tax breaks because he's working with the Department of Defense. He's working for the people, and Clearly. he knows they're powerful enough to pick him out and throw him in the ocean, and he'll ne he'll be remembered in the footnotes of history. But that's all it, all, all where he'll be. He won't be able to make his his. But his whole look at his style. Look at the way he's been built. He's turned from something to something really strange and significant that the whole world should take notice of. And I find it really i'm drawn to both the the figures of klaus schwab and him as being the same cut from the same cloth uh, at two separate points in two separate eras like two separate points in their history so klaus schwab's coming to the end of his technocratic reign and during that era it looked like that and i see musk and the new technocrats and the building of the mega city being in the next era and that's going to be people who are really they don't care about you at all oh, well, they none will of them, none see of them do. you as meat they oh, will of course. see you as meat but they, no and they will Jump through that, you. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. I, if do you, if there's any way you can do this again, we should do it again. I'd, I, love, I, to. I'd love to. Hey, 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 one of one of the things is is I've already seen positive change, and I was expecting to see positive change, but I I see it as also Let's jump on it. coins. But they they they're also coins thrown by a guy passing in a carriage. Grab them. Let's it's, grab them in a space carriage. Hey, hmm. hey, the solution is this process of truth that you talked about from the very beginning when you come down from the the hills with the shrooms it's truth and i, I think truth is spiritual i think doubt is spiritual um and i think we're all on this spiritual journey and i think because of my research because the science that we're all going to judge ourselves at some point so we don't need mm -hmm. to worry about some mean god judging us we are going to judge ourselves with this this life will end and our consciousness will continue because that's what the evidence says and it's said forever every wisdom tradition throughout time and le recently they've tried to refigure it no it maybe it doesn't maybe you need to be up in the silicon no freaking go talk to every wisdom tradition forever your consciousness doesn't end with death and there's something um, in the i'm end. completely down with that i'm completely down with that man i i believe i believe it just keeps going i believe this i i, I believe there's a whole load of energy just flying around the place and we've got eyes to see things and we've got a body to feel things and all of this but see if we can't do anything about all of the energy all around the place and it all means different things okay i tell you what let's let's wrap this up would you think about would you think about that how to take what you guys are doing and let's test it twitter says we're open now we're open for business everyone can get this we're no more d platform we're no more playing this cat and mouse game on youtube oh don't say that word no elon says the door is open let's walk through the door what do mm -hmm. we need to do that who do yeah, we need to I, do that i i've been feeling i've been feeling i've been i i, I try and do that all of the time i try i'm i i i but i i don't know how far to push it i think the way to do it is to be up front and saying we're testing whether or not the gates are open you said the gates are open here's the truth and we could just start all the stuff you've done tell me what what we need to take unlimited hangout to twitter on the next level and run ads and say <laughs> well that'd be interesting that'd be I'd, i'll have to talk to whitney but yeah I'll, uh, that'd be interesting because i mean we, i don't even know what the internet's going to look like in a couple of years time so i mean most of the time we 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 spend we spend research and most of the free time we got uh, right, uh, we spend researching all the rest of the time we exactly we the kids so we 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 are uh looking at taking a bit of time off in february but that is something focusing on getting stuff out that really cuts through would be something that i really need to do. i need to get right but we i mean the whole the thing is is that everybody's got to get together on this we there's going to be two the sides will become more and more polarized it will be truth or it will be lies you won't have another option and by the end of it everybody will know which side you're on okay you're awesome we'll be in touch awesome man see awesome. you see you later Thanks again to Johnny Vedmore for joining me today on Skeptico. Check out his website, johnnyvedmore.com. I have a number of interviews coming up related to this topic. It's been quite an interesting little 
journey down this path, very much in keeping with the Skeptico reboot thing. I'm just kind of following the data and following the deception. And let's see if you enjoy where it takes us for the ride. So that's it for now. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.